What advice would you give other people when they're trying to find the courage to, I don't know, take an audit of their parents would be a fair word, but something along those lines. I think it really is a process of curation and figuring out what worked and what didn't work. We rebel against our parents, and that is to an extent true, but we also definitely learn from our parents. I mean, that's what the human experience is about. It's about moving from one generation and to the next and learning and building on what our ancestors have done before us. Hey guys, it's Jewel with Live from San Quarantine. This is our fourth show. I'm very excited to be joined today by our guest, Misha Collins. Uh, Misha, I've been an admirer of yours for quite a long time, um, following your story. I've never heard somebody with such a colorful upbringing. I know there's many out there, but we just don't often get to hear them. Um, for people that might not be familiar, would you tell us some of your background? Um, sure. I, uh, and, and I'm honored by that introduction. Um, the feeling is mutual. Um, I was raised by a single mother um, who we were at, time, at times homeless and at times on, uh, on welfare. Um, I grew up in Western Massachusetts and um, my mother was very anti-establishment and very iconoclastic and we had a lot of adventures, um, but we also had you know some tough times uh, growing up where um, where we weren't quite sure where our next meal would come from and where we depended on the kindness of strangers um, to take us you know out of a tent on the side of the road and and into proper shelter and and things like that. Um, I moved around a lot as a child, and so I think I. I developed some skills in that process of adapting to um, new situations quickly. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, there was like two sides to every, every coin, I feel like when I was growing up. Um, I was on the one hand learning certain skills and resilience um, and having great adventures. And on the other hand, lacking in certain, you know, feelings of, uh, of stability and security. Um, and so I, and those things have manifested very nicely in my adult life where sometimes I'm like very insecure about, you know, running out of money or something like that. And other times I realize I don't need money to be happy. Um, and so it's interesting to sort of trace these things back and, uh, and observe how they affect us in our adult life. But you and I had a, brief chat the other day about, you know, seeing how scarcity in childhood and and some exposure to hardship can actually help us as grown-ups um, cultivate empathy. And I definitely feel like that has been true for me. I do feel like, um, for all my flaws, I, I, I do feel like an empathetic grown-up. Um, and, I, and I attribute um, my childhood and my mother, who was very loving, very attentive um, uh, to helping me cultivate that. Yeah, it is interesting as we look back at our childhoods. I had a somewhat similar childhood, too. I didn't live in tents, but I was very, we moved a lot. I think I had, I think I counted once it was 20 or 22 homes between the ages of 8 and 18. Uh, a lot of moving around, a lot of different schools. Similar to you, I didn't really make friends. I started to really see friends and having a home as a liability. Mm -hmm. I was pretty perfectly designed to become a musician. Touring and continuing to moving around was really good for me, but learning to like set roots down was really frightening. And seeing how many gifts my childhood gave me, resiliency, um, a lot of adaptability, a lot of adventures, and then as an adult, really realizing I was scared a lot and I didn't know I was scared. It was like, I don't know if I compartmentalized it or if there's language like that. I certainly wasn't aware of it. But as I got older, I started to become really aware of, um, I loved singing in bars when I was a kid. Uh, I fought for it, actually. I really, my dad and I sang in bars. And so I started at age eight and I still wouldn't change it. But as an adult now, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, I was an eight-year-old girl. My dad was drunk. 
And I was doing five hour sets in bars and men would, you know, take me aside and put a dime in my hand and close my fingers around it and say, call me when you're 16, you're going to be great to F when you're older. Uh And I learned to look after myself and luckily nothing bad or dangerous ever happened. But it was almost like the fear hit me later. I never knew to be afraid. I did crazy things. I hitchhiked by myself when I was 16 through America and Mexico. Do you relate to that at all? Did you kind of have like a delayed reaction? It, it with I, we could swap genders and maybe uh, uh, sorry sexes and maybe the and uh, you know the the bar story doesn't quite resonate for me but this is my that sounds like my childhood to a T I mean we I was uh, we lived in fifteen places by the time I was fifteen years old I was in a new school pr- pretty much every year sometimes twice a year um, I did learn to not I, I not put roots down and not feel comfortable when roots were laid down Um, and I was hitchhiking. I was hitchhiking from a very young age, probably 12. My brother and I would go and visit my dad every other weekend in Boston and we'd take the bus out to meet him. And then he would give us money to get on the bus to return to my mom. And we would say, ah, don't worry about it, dad. We'll, We'll walk to the bus station. And then we'd take the money and hitchhike home, which was, you know, 110 miles. And I think we started doing that when I was 11 and my brother was nine. Um, And all of these things were framed in my young mind as incredible adventures and reasons why I was better and stronger than other people. And then when, and, and it really hit hard for me when I had kids and I started to reflect on, oh, that wasn't really necessarily a safe place for a kid to be. I mean, I did, I got picked up hitchhiking all the time as a pubescent, you know, young man where guys would like put their hand on my leg and I'd be like, I got to get out of the car right now. And, and again, like you, nothing ever really terrible happened, but I was on the edge. I was in these situations that were remarkably unsafe. And when I think about my kids and the level of protection that I want to provide them, it, it, makes that all feel very stark. Um, And yet it's really interesting because I don't, I also wouldn't give it up. I wouldn't trade it, but it's, it is something that as an adult, I'm glad that I've gained a little perspective on and started to, to be able to reflect on what was maybe healthy and what wasn't healthy and, and trying to make these little calculations with my kids about what I want to try to pass on to them and what I want to protect them from. Um, but it's it's yeah it's interesting how how similar I you know I read up about you, and it's it's very interesting how similar our uh, our stories are, um, and 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 you know we're the same age we both yeah, write three poetry. months apart I saw yeah <laughs> you write poetry yeah <laughs> remarkable <laughs> maybe my dad knew your mom I'm just throwing it out there I'm just oh. <laughs> um. When we introspect and start looking at our childhood and our parents as flawed, um, a lot of people don't want to start that process because they feel it's absolute, it's a black and white, right? I can't see that there's any flaw with my dad because it would, I don't know, maybe ruin my image of him. Uh, Something I really work and talk a lot with my friends is you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, when you see your parents have a flaw, that they had things that were less than desirable and other things that were also good. How do you hold that when you look at your mom and see the parts where she obviously created a tremendous sense of adventure? It sounds like she was really magical creating meals that I don't cook as well, it sounds like, with my kitchen. Uh, but your mom cooked these beautiful, amazing meals in crazy circumstances, like in a tent or in a burner in the office, you know, with no windows that you guys were all living in. Um, And yet there was also this sort of dichotomy of it didn't feel safe and it didn't feel stable. How have you processed that in terms of thinking about your mom as a parent and kind of what advice would you give other people when they're trying to find the courage to, I don't know if take an audit of their parents would be a fair word, but something along those lines. I think it's been a bit of a pendulum for me. I, I've, I've had moments, I mean, when I was younger, I really think I painted in broad brush strokes my childhood and my mother very heroically. Um, I, I, I saw I, I, only the adventure and um, 
and only you know the good things that it brought for me as a child. Um, but as I, I got older, um, I started to sort of swing in the other direction and, and think, oh, this was all terrible. I have to rebel against that and be totally different myself. And I think it really is a process of curation and figuring out what worked and what didn't work. And like you say, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They say, you know, things skip a generation and, and we rebel against our parents. And that is to an extent true, but we also definitely learn from our parents. I mean, that's what the human experience is about. It's about moving from one generation and to the next and learning and building on what our ancestors have done before us. And, um, and, and that goes for our parents just as well as it does the, you know, the, the whole, the totality of the human family. Um, so yeah, it's a calculus, but it's challenging because it's all like, it's, it's all rolled up and all of those emotions that we're often so powerless to overcome. One of the things that we've been doing with the, our youth foundation is having our kids do a sort of a business plan for their life where they figure out what the entire expenses are for the household. Let's say there's four of them, two parents and two kids. They have to see what a quarter of those bills are. So no matter what their parent is like, they do realize their parent is trying to carry a responsibility that's very, very difficult. Um, and if it's age appropriate, we have the kids starting to earn that amount just so they can start to get an idea and a relation of like, this is something, you know, even if all my needs aren't being met, which is so true. We don't get all of our needs met. It doesn't make it okay. It just makes it human. And it does let a lot of the resentment and the anger go. Mm -hmm. What got you into mindfulness? Um, when we were talking the other day, you said you've been practicing for 20 years, 20 some odd years. Uh, what got you going and how'd you get into it? I think uh, like probably a lot of people, I was at, at, a, at a low point in my life and at a point where I was searching and having a bit of an existential crisis. You know, I was, I was uh, asking myself and everyone I knew, what's the point? What is the point of like, why, why am I pursuing all, uh, you know, this career and, and what is it that I'm striving for? And what is my place on this planet and purpose? And, um, and I, I, I think that just sort of ex exploration and poking around, um, led me to, um, you know, a meditation retreat and it was a very profound experience. And I realized right away that this was something that was, this was a, was a path that was going to be beneficial to me. And I have stuck with it ever since. For people that don't know what meditation is or mindfulness is, uh, it can be described as so mysterious. You know, I, I remember hearing people talk about meditation. It was like, you should hear a constant ohm of the universe. I never heard that. Um, that, would be, that would actually get <laughs> irritating very quickly. Yeah. It sounds like tinnitus. <laughs> it does sound like tinnitus. Um, how would you describe meditation? What, how would you tell people to meditate? Um, what's, what's your routine? Well, I don't think I would. I would tell people... I would tell people how to meditate. I think that it, it's it's a good idea to um, learn the practice from a really skilled meditation teacher um, in the right context. Um, but in in very simple conceptual framework, um, for me, mindfulness meditation is really just about paying attention in the simplest way to what's happening at this moment. Um, the 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 simplest form of mindful and mindfulness meditation as far as i'm concerned is just paying attention to your breath um, and the meditation that i practice focuses on a lot of paying attention to your breath paying attention to the sensations on your body paying attention to sounds in your environment um, and it's very very simple and it's it's actually not terribly conceptually complicated um, but it's remarkably challenging because your mind wants to go elsewhere and it's trained to go elsewhere um and and it can be it can feel frustrating at first and there's there's a bit of it's almost like when you start you know training for for a 10k or something the first you know couple of weeks it feels really hard and then it starts to feel easier and more rewarding and you start to get the endorphin rush and and meditation is i think very similar um it starts more challenging, but if you can if you can push through uh, that challenge, or sit through that challenge, 
um, it gets easier and more rewarding. Yeah, that's so true. I, I liken it to going to the gym a lot. Um, it is just the willingness to be present with whatever's going on. Um, and the nice thing is, you know, if you want to know how to be mindful, just be observant and curious and it instantly snaps you into the present moment. You can't help it. So if you're really anxious, if I'm really anxious, I suddenly get very, very curious about the colors in the room or the smells in the room or the light in the room or the sensations in my body. And it just sort of snaps you to it. Another really counterintuitive thing I found about it is we tend to want to push uncomfortable feelings away. And as you start to learn through mindfulness to invite uncomfortable feelings closer to you. It's like it takes the power away from the monster, if you will. It's so counterintuitive. Um, our brains actually process emotional pain in the same center as physical pain. And when I learned that, I was like, that's why having a broken heart feels like I'm going to die. You know, your brain doesn't know the difference between a broken heart and a broken leg, for instance. Um, but the more you can invite it in, and it's so counterintuitive, and it's so uncomfortable, but just like going to the gym, as you practice, it gets easier. I really liken meditation to doing a bicep curl. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the science on it. I found it really fascinating. They've shown that in eight weeks of practicing, I think, 15 minutes twice a day, you can actually grow a fold in your frontal lobe. Uh, and you can start to thing? shrink you, your amygdala. You want folds in your, in your lobe? We want more robust buff folds in our frontal lobes. I want a buff, you know, <laughs> frontal lobe, just like butch like frontal yeah, lobe yeah um yeah that's okay. where our joy and reason and processing exists then our amygdala isn't all bad almost all our emotions are processed there but processed there but start to starve the neural circuits that are just addicted to sort of anxiety patterns and circuits did the adversities in your childhood help you in life and in your career and how did you see those benefit you yes definitely i mean i don't think i would have even chosen the career path of an artist had I not faced the adversity that I had. And also my mother was an artist and she sort of showed me that that was a, uh, a possibility in life. Um, but I think one of the main, one of the big things that I took away from my childhood was um, I, I, I'm not a risk averse person um, because over and over again, the experiences of my childhood taught me that things would work out one way or another even without a, a safety net. And knowing that as, a, as an adult and as a young man, um, it, it enabled me to sort of take leaps and take risks that um, I think a lot of people don't. And so I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, and it's still a part of me. I'm, I'm willing to, you know, take risks. That is so true. When I look at what our kids are, our kids are around the same age, I think. Um, I think one year older and one year younger. Not that I've been stalking you or your family, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but the jobs, you know, let's say they go to college, the, jo the jobs they'll get out of college probably won't even be invented while they're in college. So the ability to pivot, to think on your feet, to be highly creative, to solve problems, um, to lean into the unknown, to mm -hmm. piecework together, those are really the skills our kids are going to need. And I look at the education system right now and how we're starting to teach them through memorization, and it really doesn't teach that. Those are skills I learned outside of school. Uh, knowing those types of things, knowing you deliberately want to keep some things that your childhood gave you and also introduce some new and different ones, what are you thinking about in terms of parenting? Um, not only during COVID, because it really struck me that the environment your mom was able to create of this being sort of a magical narrative, our kids need that during COVID. You know, this is, um, they're going to remember the mood in the home much more than did we get our homework done. Uh, and so how are you handling that with your children during COVID? And then on the larger scale, how are you kind of looking at incorporating some of those lessons so that they can go into the world um, with some of these skills that are so beneficial? Um, well, I don't, I don't know if I, um, I don't feel like I've been doing a great job of that as a parent um, to date. I think I've been largely plugging the kids into, um, you know, the school system and and a routine that feels a little bit staid and a little conservative and a little safe. And I haven't been showing up in the way that I had imagined I would as a parent. And it's been a source of frustration for me. And it's partly because I've, you know, created this busy adult life 
for myself that has so many responsibilities that I don't feel like I quite have time, but it's, and I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm being a little hyperbolic. I mean, I do play with the kids and we do, we do have adventures and we do in, you know, invent, invent things together. Um, but COVID has been an interesting experience because we're all nestled in together and that excuse of I'm too busy is being stripped away and it's been lovely. Um, yesterday, um, we built a trebuchet. Uh, maybe I can even show it to you. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it out the window. It's a catapult. Wow, that's huge. What the hell? Did you just have that laying around? Sorry, I'm cursing. Oh no, <laughs> we had scrap wood and so we built a catapult so that we could try to launch things at the boats in the harbor. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I was like, oh, this is what I should have been doing as a parent all along. And uh, and so COVID has been really nice in like it, it, it coalescing us around creative adventure in a way that I kind of wish I had been uh, parenting all along. Um, yeah, I don't know if I really answered the question. But. I did, and How I actually you? really I mean, how, appreciate how are you that. Finding, how are you finding the experience? And uh, uh, like, what's different for you? Let's see, I resonated with a lot of things you were saying about that. I've been lucky that as a musician, I'm able to keep my son with me pretty much everywhere. So he does travel with me. Um, I am a single mom. It was interesting as I made a decision to settle down and like have a house post-divorce, so much anxiety came up every time I came home. I didn't really understand why and I realized I'm terrified of having a home. Like nothing good has ever happened in a home for me. And I'm 45 and it was so weird to really come to grips with like a very deep, what I kind of kept very subconscious anxiety of like, yee, roots, yee. And I noticed it affected my parenting. It, it, I, was, I was there with my son a lot, but it was sometimes hard for me to stay in my body in a way. It was hard for me to stay incredibly present. Connection's terrifying. You know, the way I was raised, it was terrifying. And I want nothing more than me kick my son. We do have an amazing, amazing relationship. But I'm always just astounded at how much I learn from being a parent about presence, about being able to be more present than I ever thought, or when I thought I was present, going, oh, there's a whole new gear of presence. Um, and juggling a career and being a single mom. Again, I feel incredibly lucky because I have money. Mm -hmm. I was, I could afford a divorce. I can afford a home for my son and I, um, I can afford to travel with my son and have him with me everywhere. So, I mean, I'm beyond lucky and blessed. Um, and, and really grateful for how much I just continue to learn every day and how intelligent my son is. And it's like having an instant feedback, you know, you instantly can kind of tell if you're truly, truly present or not. Um, Oh yeah. I can tell if it's hitting my buttons of, uh, I remember thinking that, you know, he's eight now. So we have just so much more of a, it grows every year. It's amazing. The relationship, but I remember thinking like, what if my son doesn't like me? It terrified me. He does like me, you know, but it was a funny thought to have come up and I really noticed it. Um, and the idea I was like, Oh, I bet some part of me is really terrified. Like what if my son ever didn't love me? Like all those issues from my childhood, and I'm so grateful I see them. I'm so grateful I'm mindful enough to notice them happening and I'm not afraid of noticing those thoughts. Um, but it made me think of that when you were talking about, you know, the life you build as a parent and what kind of parent you thought you'd be and what emotional skills it takes to kind of unwind uh, some of the structures we've had to build to create safety or who knows what, to be able to be a really present parent. Um, I do think with COVID, I've been home a long time now. I quit working a year and a half ago to write a book and a record. Mm -hmm. um, and so we haven't been traveling at all. We've been at home solid. It's been amazing experience. And it's what really allowed me to kind of look into feeling all these feelings and watching it all. Um, but I'm talking to a lot of my other mom friends and parents and they're going, you know what? We had our kids so overscheduled with so many sports and being competitive with all the other kids academically and I've met a lot of parents that are willing to make some lifelong changes now. They don't want to go back to just normal. 
Um, I know some parents are going to scale back their work. Um, I know some parents are going to scale back their kids' schedules and just say, we're not doing soccer. Like, mm -hmm. This is so much more important. What I've learned we can gain in closeness is so much more important. Um, so I've liked that. I, I like thinking of staying home as a form of activism. You know, maybe as a celebrity, you know, we have to fly to New York or things to do TV shows. What if I just insisted on doing it like this so I can stay with my son or so I don't have to waste, waste fossil fuels? I like the opportunity. You know, like you, I think adversity always is a tremendous opportunity. You just start to learn when you face enough adversity that it's this situation's upon us whether we like it or not. So I'm going to make the best of it or I'm going to let it tank me. You just start to see things in these very kind of black and white ways. When I think about COVID, I think, you know, we're, the experience is on us. We don't get to control how long it lasts, but we do get to control how it changes us. So are we going to introspect and come out of this transformed in a positive way? Or are we going to suppress feelings? And are we going to become more anxiety and more afraid to be out in public? And that to me is what's really interesting and why I think people who have faced such extreme adversity have so much knowledge to share because uh, there's already sort of this muscle built around all right it's another hard time this is how I get through it you have so many fans I'm seeing so many fans how did you build this amazing community with your fan base it seems so tight-knit and really personal oh I you know I I don't know I mean I think that it was a two-way street I think we um we kind of found each other and I think that this this particular fandom around this particular show and my personality, we sort of immediately got into a kind of playful dynamic where I think <laughs> I think we somehow un in an unspoken decision, myself and the fandom decided to um, play with the um, fan celebrity um, expectations and maybe subvert them and just have a different sort of playful dynamic. Um, and yeah, so I, I, yeah, it's been sort of like this interesting, um, gratifying, creative, I think charitable, um, interesting community building experiment that we've all conducted together. Um, yeah, it's, it's very surreal. <laughs> it seems like you're really able to, a lot of people feel trapped by celebrity. They feel like they have to be perfect. People feel that way if they're not famous too. But then suddenly cameras get on you and you really feel like I have to be perfect. And I know a lot of people that start to feel like they're living a lie or they can't make a misstep. You seem to have a really open and vulnerable well, I mean, I don't have a, as a perfect person, I don't have a particular <laughs> quandary. Um, yeah, no, you know, it's interesting. So um, the, my, uh, my wife's advisor uh, in her PhD program wrote a book on uh, Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn Monroe had cultivated her public persona. Yeah. to a T, like she observed the starlets of, of her day and decided to color her hair in a certain way, get her nose job done in a certain way, affect a certain manner of speech. Her um, walk, I read, yeah. Carefully cultivated. And when I started to, you know, get a little bit of no notoriety on this show and, and started to confront the possibility of celebrity, I thought, I, this is my Marilyn Monroe moment. This is my opportunity to cultivate the perfect um, archetype of American masculinity that I will then use to catapult myself to you know, unparalleled stardom. And I did a couple of interviews with, like I, I sort of developed a little bit of a framework of how I wanted to be perceived and how, what persona I wanted to cultivate publicly. And I did a couple of interviews and it felt so staid and artificial and wooden and awful. And I was like, fuck this. I'm, that's not going to work for me at all. If I am trying to pretend that I'm someone other than who I am, it's going to be a catastrophic failure. And if I'm feeling guarded and like I'm hiding things, it's going to be a catastrophic failure. And so I just kind of, you know, vomited my personality out <laughs> onto people and um, you know, and I think it was, it was surprising enough that um, people seem to respond to it. Okay. <laughs> Is it weird not to see a guitar when you play? I'll scoot back. Okay, there we go. Living their lives 
lives for you on TV. They say they're better than you, and you agree. Yeah. She says, Hold my calls from me. I know cold brick walls is coming for me. There's nothing for free. Another burger, another hot dog, surprise. You wish in the well, hope your health don't go to hell. Well, another doctor's bill, a lawyer's bill, another cute, cheap thrill. You know you love them if you put them in your will. But who is saying your soul? When it comes to the flowers and who you hey, hey, you save your soul after all these lies you told and who is save your soul if you won't save your own la la da 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 We'd ride a hustle and ride a bustle and ride a cuss and then the cops want someone to bust down on Orleans Avenue, oh. Another day, another dollar, another war, another tower, when well, the homeless had their home, so we prayed to his men and different gods as there are flowers, but we call religion our friend, we are so worried about saving our souls afraid that god will take his toll that we forget to begin my who will save your soul when it comes to the baby well hey, hey. well save your soul after all of those lies that you told and who will save your soul if you won't say no, la la, da 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 Now some are walking, and some are talking, and some are stalking their kill. You got so-called social security, but that don't pay your bills, cause there's addictions to feed, and our mouths to pay. So you bargain with the devil, say you're okay today. Say that you love them, take their money and run. Say it's been well, sweetheart, but it was just one of those things. Those strings, those flings, 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 those your soul when it comes to the memories hey hey hey, hey. well say your soul after all of those lies you will see save your As you sing. Um, it's an impossible act to follow, but I'll do my best. I was talking to my neighbor across the fence um, and bragging that I was going to be talking to you later today, and she said, no way. I was a huge fan of Jewel and met her in the 90s, and then she went back into her house and looked for something that you had, you had written her a poem very graciously that she couldn't find, but she brought me this book <gasps> of your poem. <laughs> and so I'm gonna, <clears throat> I noticed that, um, that you have a poem that has AM in the title here, and I have a poem that has AM in the title. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you both of these. <laughs> um, amazing. 
and embarrassing. And yes. yes, this is Paramount, New York, 9.34 a.m. Um, in the morning, tiny bells go off that light a darkened path, reluctant as pinpricks. Dawn pierces sleep with nimble fingers. I am unwoven, the rich yoke of slumber, unraveled thread by thread, until I am naked and glistening, standing before the newness of another day, a tiny form birthed of white linen and restless dreams. What a lovely poem, which I wasn't planning to read to you, but when you put me on the spot. <laughs> I, um, yeah, wow, that came back on me. Woo. <laughs> okay, here's, here's, uh, here's my poem that is simply titled AM. Waking up, there are always things to be grateful for. Obvious, easy things. Like first sun climbing past the petals of the bougainvillea through my bedroom window and knocking in patches on my eyelids. That's easy. Who could not, how could I not be thankful for that? Or another thing. Witnessing her sleeping cheeks stretch into her yawning, I love you, good morning grin. If you saw it, you'd know anyone would feel lucky then. Or the scratching of those little finch feet on the feeder. I think when I hear that, thank God, thank God for that. But this morning, when I swung sitting sideways on the edge of the bed in that space before standing, I found a big thing I had been missing. I am grateful for me. And I have to remember to thank myself for everything. That is awesome. That's thank it. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for putting me on the spot. Boy, isn't <laughs> it true? It's, I don't know if you were like this. I have always had such a hard time feeling proud of myself or feeling like I could take credit for something. Were you like that at all? I am very much like that now. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, it's very hard for me. I'm actually, one of my things I'm really focusing on right now is celebration. So I wanted to introduce uh, the next guest. Um, his name's Mark Brackett. Mark, I'm so yes. excited to talk to you. Um, Thank you. Feelings is one of my favorite topics. It seems like it. <laughs> it is really shocking to me that we are not given any education. You know, I realized uh, for anybody just joining us, um, I was raised in Alaska. My mom left when I was eight. Uh, my dad took over raising us. He had really bad PTSD, started drinking to try and manage that PTSD. There wasn't even a word for PST, PTSD, I'm dyslexic too. <laughs> um, and it was obviously confusing. I moved out at 15 and I knew that I should become a statistic. I knew statistically kids like me repeat the cycle they're raised by. And this point was really driven home by a bunny that we owned. We had a bunny named Caramel and it we got it as a tiny baby and it's not safe in Alaska for rabbits to be running around. So we put it in the chicken coop. So it raised from infancy with a chicken. Well, a lots of chickens. And this bunny would peck at food, kind of like a chicken. And it had a funny wobble hop, the way chickens kind of have a funny hobble, wobble. And it even would lay on the eggs and hatch eggs. Um, and so this big giant bunny would be sitting on this nest and it was so cute. And you'd see little baby chickies, you know, poking up from around this fluffy bunny. But when I moved out of 15, that image terrified me because I thought, what if I'm a bunny that was raised by chickens and I don't, won't ever get to know my actual bunny nature? What if my nurture was so bad I could never get to know my real nature? Could I get to know my real nature even though my nurture is bad? How do you do that? Uh, I was aware of what I called emotional English at the time, that as much as I had a genetic inheritance, there was an emotional inheritance. You know, I could look generations in my family and see an emotional language that was taught. It was volatile, it was unpredictable, uh, didn't handle conflict very well, a lot of things were unspoken. Uh, but it was really daunting at 15 to say, all right, I don't wanna be a statistic, I don't wanna repeat the cycle, I don't like the emotional language that was taught in my house, but there's nowhere I can go to learn a new emotional language. You can go to college yeah. to learn Spanish or French. And, you know, as a child, you could say, I hate speaking English. English really hurt me. I'm never going to speak English to my kids. Unless you learn Spanish, you're going to speak English. And our right. emotional habits are the exact same way. We can, my dad's a great example. He was very abused as a child, swore he'd never do it, knew it hurt, knew it was wrong. Went off to Vietnam, got married, mom left, and then all of a sudden, 
emotional English. He started speaking the same language he was raised with. There was nowhere to go to learn a new one. And so as I looked at that, it was very daunting. My strategy was to try and look at people that had skills that I liked. And I kept a notebook and I would journal and go, I watched how that dad interacted with that child. It was tender. Uh, I saw that child mess up and the dad was kind. All right, I'm gonna write that down. And I tried to take notes. And I got, I did pretty good. And then by the time I got homeless, I started having panic attacks and was agoraphobic. And it opened up this whole new level of self-observation and self-awareness of realizing the more I could perceive, the more good type of power I could have over my actions, the more I could get in the driver's seat and not let my brain go on this sort of uh, sure. autopilot, if you will. I realized that I had the wrong name to the wrong emotions. So I was raised dyslexic, or I am dyslexic. And so you get things backwards. I realized I had, I'm writing a book right now, it's what I'm calling emotional dyslexia, where, you know, a name can be really arbitrary, right? If you are shown a red apple and your mom says, this is yellow, you're gonna call the color red yellow, it's just a name. And so with feelings, if they're mislabeled in our household, you know, I have an abusive household, but every night I'm told I'm loved when I'm tucked in, I'm going to call a million data points of what all that is. I'm going to label that love. Can you talk to us about correctly identifying emotions and being emotionally literate just when it comes to identifying some feelings? Yeah, that's a, um, something that I think a lot about because I had a similar problem to you, um, which was uh, no one gave me language for my feelings as a kid. And I was an abused kid. And so here I was trapped you know, with my feelings and told by someone that I really couldn't share anything that was happening to me. Um, I went home and I had two parents who loved me, but um, my mom uh, had a terrible anxiety problem. So she would have nervous breakdowns regularly. So I was like, oh, I'm not gonna talk to my mom about my feelings because she'll have a breakdown. <laughs> and then my father was a real tough guy, you know? And uh, so he would just say, so you gotta toughen up. So there was no opportunity to, communicate feeling. So what do you do? You lock yourself in your room, you do weird things, you eat your feelings, you bang your feelings against the wall. Um, and it wasn't until I became you know, a psychologist that I realized you know, how important it was to be granular. You know, and um, I had an uncle who was my hero in life when I was a teenager who was writing a book on feelings back in the 70s. And so he, was started, he started teaching me back then these broad ideas of like, well, maybe you're feeling alienated, you know, maybe you're feeling, you know, despair. Um, and so then we talk about the meaning of these words. And what we say is that you have to name it to tame it, right? You have to feel it to heal it. And, um, and for me, what's really important is that even with the anxiety family, there's a broad range of anxieties, right? So the best example I have for myself is when I was going up for tenure as a professor about I don't know, 10 years ago, I was having heartburn and it was, you know, was all this catastrophe. I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. And then I went to the doctor, you know, medical school here where I'm a professor. And the doctor said, here's your Prilosec for your heartburn and here's your Ativan for your anxiety. <laughs> and I was like, really? It, that's your, that's, that's, you know, do you know, like, do you know what my day job is? Um, anyhow, and then I took like a mindful walk and I was like, you know, Mark, what the heck is going on for you? Like, how are you feeling? And was I stressed? I don't know. I wasn't really stressed because stress is like, you know, you have too many demands and not enough resources. And I was like getting through the day. So stress really wasn't it, although that's what I was calling it. Am I anxious? Well, anxiety is uncertainty. I have a pretty good, you know, a lot of publications and what I needed to become a professor. I don't think that's it either. Um, and I'm like, well, what the heck is it? And I realized I was overwhelmed. I was just chronically busy and overwhelmed and I had no freedom or space. I would go to yoga from seven to eight at night and then go back home and eat dinner and then do email. <laughs> so I built in my mindfulness time then I just kept on going to be, you know. And I realized the only thing that was gonna give me sense of contentment or well-being was doing less. So this, the, you know, the anxiety made me think I need this, the stress made me think I need that, but it wasn't until I really labeled my experience 
you know, that I was able to do it. And I find in my work that I ask people, you know, I'm afraid to, can I test you on your emotional intelligence? Say again. Can I test you on your uh, emotion language? Sure, go for All it. Right. So this is what I give a lot of people and people like, you know, get a little stuck on it. So the difference between anger and disappointment. Uh, disappointment feels more personal. Anger uh -huh. for me feels very broad. And it usually tells me about a boundary and it's very quick and goes away quickly. Uh, disappointment usually has a lot more to do with self-reflection, more personal. And I'd say it's in the realm of love. So if I gave it a family of feelings, I would say it belongs to the family of love. It's very personal. Okay. All right. So pretty good. I mean, if we get like to the like psychology definition, right? Disappointment, unmet expectations. Mm -hmm. Right. I thought this was going to work out, but everything's legitimate, right? And it just, just mm -hmm. didn't work out. Or anger, you know, typically has that like feeling of injustice or unfairness. Mm -hmm. And you know, the reason why that's important is that you know, you're a mom. Your kid comes home from school or wherever they come home from. They're yelling and screaming, "I hate you!" And blah, 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 whatever they get, you know, having a fit. They look angry. We then label the emotion for the child. They're telling them, "Stop being so angry and get yourself together, calm down," without really being the emotion scientist that finds out what's happening, the story behind the behavior, um, to then help the child label it properly, to then help them regulate it effectively. And you see how much work that is? Mm -hmm. And I think this is getting at what you were opening our conversation with, you know, with which is that you guys spend a lot of time being that emotion coach you know, to the child to not you know, label their behavior but to have that ability to be calm and have the conversation to find out the cause of the feeling, to then label the feeling, to then support them. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what we have to make part of our education system and part of parenting. For people that are trying to take some concrete takeaways, what do I do? I know I'm emotional. I know my emotions feel overwhelming. My emotions feel overwhelming. What are kind of three things that people can take away from this they can start to digest of course along with getting your book and reading it thank you uh, i think the first thing is a giving yourself the permission to feel and giving everybody who you love and even the people you don't love so much right the permission to feel like just it's okay to have whatever feeling you're having don't judge it embrace it um the second thing is i say you know, be an emotion scientist, be curious, um, be open. Um, when you fail, just say, you know what, I failed today, but I can do better tomorrow. And then the last piece, well, there's a lot more pieces, but what I would say is that just work on getting the skills, developing the skills, build your emotion vocabulary, and, um, and learn strategies to help you regulate. We talked about a lot of them today. We talked about breathing. We talked about self-talk. We talked about reappraising. Those are three like research-based strategies that if you apply them to your life, you'll be healthier, you'll be happier, and you'll be more productive and um, hopefully achieve your dreams. Would you mind taking a few questions? We have some people queued up in the, the live room. Yeah, of course. Hi. You are on. I think your mute is on. So if you click your microphone, I feel like this has been the Zoom conversation of like yes. <laughs> everyone. Hi, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hello. Krisha? Nice yeah, to see I'm you. Krisha. So What's your I have, question? Uh, this is my question for Mark. Um, sure. I have his book, but I haven't finished it. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being an inspiration. Um, I just want to ask um, if you have any suggestions um, in finding motivation in this challenging times. I'm an educator, but, you know, because of different, you know, policies and procedures, we don't have children in our care right now. And, and right. I'm finding it really hard to feel motivated and inspired. And, you know, I want to be able to help my colleagues feel inspired too, but it's, you know, it's really challenging at this moment. So I just want to know what your thoughts are and, you know, what you have Thank to you. say about this. Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for the question. Um, and I would say, you know, it's hard. Sometimes I feel a lack of motivation too. You know, I'm sitting at home. I'm used to being in my office. I'm used to presenting to people. Um, 
And so what I'd recommend is something I said earlier is think about like what you're here for. It seems like you're an educator. You want to help children, right, grow and develop. So like just put your mind into that, like thinking about what their needs are. And sometimes it's okay to forget about your own needs for a little while and just think about being the giver of the love and the giver of the ideas. And I think that can be really helpful. And maybe spend some time. Are you you're an actual teacher yourself? Sorry? Are you a teacher yourself? I'm a, I'm a teacher at a daycare. So I'm an early childhood educator. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So right now early childhood setting, you know, these settings are, are tough. Um, you know, think about the needs that these kids are going to have for someone who's as kind and compassionate as you are. And just go through that lens. And so if you just shift the thinking and saying, wow, these kids really need me. And I can't wait to go back to support them to help them get through these difficult times. I think that could be really helpful. I don't know what you think about that. Okay, yeah. I mean that, yeah, kind of shifting your mind and going back to like the reason why you're doing what you're doing. It, it's kind of, you know, challenging to it to is. really go back to to where you want you want it to be before all this happened. It's very overwhelming and it you is. know, not being able to support them physically because they're away from us is is really challenging and yeah, you could can you could imagine the feelings that I'm but feeling. I can definitely imagine it. But I think what's important for you, um, Krisha, is to remember the things that you have control over and the things that you don't have control over. And if you go if your brain just focuses on all the things that you have no control over, you're gonna go down this path of a lot of negativity. So think about what you have control over right now and Think about what you'd like to be able to um, support, you know, these children with. And I think that can be, you know, it's a, it's a helpful way of thinking. Just don't allow your brain to go to the things that you have no control over because you just have any control over it anyway. That's right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And it's hard. You got to stop and you got to catch yourself and, you know, it takes work. But I promise it'll help you deactivate. And the last thing I'll say is it's okay. Default, like it's really, it's fine. What you're telling me is that you're a caring, compassionate person, that you're having these feelings um, about the children that you take care of. It tells me that you're just a beautiful person. So um, I think recognize that that's a signal that you have a lot of empathy and compassion. Thank you. Krisha, if this helps at all, something that there's been multiple times where I haven't been able to do my main passion and so I wrote down what attracted me to it. And when I got to the really underlying things, they came down to emotional principles. So what he said about a kind, caring, compassionate person, those types of things made me have a purpose. It gave me a sense of purpose. And I ended up expressing it through, let's say, music. When I wasn't able to do music or when I became a mom, it was very disorienting. I'm not relating to my sense of purpose in the same way. When I reduced what I loved about a job, so if you wrote down, what do I love about early childhood care and development? When you boil it down to its really essential fact things, you'll find another place to do it, typically, where you can be of service and apply those things and feel like you have a purpose. There's kind of more than one way to skin a cat, as it were. There's more than one way to infuse your life with that sense of service, dedication, devotion, whatever the words are that give you that, to fill you up. I can tell you know, you're a very purpose-driven person it gives you a, a reason to be in a way it's you know so lucky when you when you have that when you know what that is and so there's other ways that are going to be creative you have to get creative about how to do it and implement it in these times but there's no shortage of need right now it's just that we have to find different ways of meeting that need which will take some creativity um, but when I realized oh it's not about the window dressing it's not about the songwriting and singing it's about these underlying things that gave me that sense of purpose, I was then able to apply that somewhere else, if that's helpful. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Krisha. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. Well, nice, nice to meet you and ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Krisha. Thank you. Uh, so those are other things I hope to be able to have you back because I really it. could yeah. talk forever and I uh, really hope to meet you in person. But it was really, I, I appreciate you doing this as, as we are. It was so fun. Thank you for inviting me. 
Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, everybody get his book, The Permission to Feel. It's wonderful. Yes. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Joel. Nice All to right. meet you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.